Hello and welcome back everyone. For our next presentation, we have Jeff Rowe who will be telling us about the fairly new CentOS Automotive SIG. It's just been around for a few months now. So thank you, Jeff Rowe. You bet, thanks Rich. So good morning or afternoon everyone, wherever you are. Uh, we're here to talk about the new CentOS Automotive SIG which we're extremely excited about. And I will... Uh, dig into this. Uh, this is just a quick agenda. I would like to do a quick introduction and go over the general goals for the SIG. Um, it's a, it's going to be, we, we expect it to be a fairly large SIG with a lot of participation and we want to make sure that the goals uh, for the rest of the year and uh, for the general goals for the SIG are, are well placed so that people can decide whether or not to participate. Of course, we hope you, we hope you do. Uh, we'll be going over the development of a decision-making process, which we're in the middle of right now, as this is essentially a new project that is starting out, and the community standards that we want to establish. And uh, uh, then we'll do some technical status. We've got uh, Rachel on, who will talk to us about our QA and build structure, and we'll talk to Al Stone about hardware support and uh, see how that's going. Um, and so let's just, uh, let's just dive in. So the big question that people want to know is why do we have an automotive SIG in CentOS in the first place? Um, there hasn't really been an automotive uh, presence, or SIG, CentOS hasn't really had a presence in the automotive world yet. And that's essentially the reason. Uh, we feel that CentOS is very well suited as a distro to fit into an in-vehicle operating system. Um, as you might guess, uh, I work for Red Hat. Uh, Rachel and Al both work for Red Hat, and a number of the early participants also work for Red Hat. Uh, this is, this does have to do with a a, uh, a a Red Hat initiative in automotive that was announced earlier this year. That uh, we'll be doing, we'll be creating an in-vehicle operating system that is uh, functionally safe and certified through ISO two six two six two, and um, where we want to do all the work for that is in public because that is simply the way that Red Hat operates. So uh, CentOS seems to us to be absolutely the best way to do that. And uh, we'll go through our contribution model in just a few seconds. But uh, really, that's the primary reason for us. We just want to make sure that we are completely transparent about that. Uh, we're very glad that the first few meetings have had a number of other organizations on. And so there is clearly a lot of interest in uh, doing an in-vehicle operating system, Linux based, uh, using a distro. And uh, uh, so that's really the main goal for the SIG. Um, we want to uh, have be, this to be a focal point for working with other upstreams. We anticipate collaborating with all existing operating systems in, in automotive, or at least all of the ones that, that we are able to collaborate with. There's certainly a lot of proprietary work done in this space. But uh, there's been a growing number of, uh, of open source efforts, particularly Linux, and particularly since the advent of automotive grade Linux from the Linux Foundation back into 2013, I believe. Uh, we anticipate using the SIG for the public development of proofs of concept of using distros in the automotive space. Uh, including a variant of CentOS specifically for automotive. I'm not going to say that you could simply download this and load it into your Centra or your Dodge or whatever, but um, but the idea is that we would have this available as a public test bed and a place for people to do some exciting work in in public, test it out, and uh, and to maybe basically go through the open source process for automotive uh, in the context of a distro. Um, we also, uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, this will be an upstream resource and a primary test bed for the Red Hat in-vehicle operating system that um, uh, we don't have a release date on that yet. It's just, it's in development and uh, this is the way we want to develop it. So uh, in general, the goals for the SIG specifically are to create, collect, curate, and collaborate on open source automotive software. Um, we plan to work directly with all of the upstream projects related to automotive uh, using uh, using uh, automotive as an edge use case. Uh, currently, a lot of efforts use the car essentially as a group of embedded systems that are interconnected. 
and uh, we have a slightly different vision for the car. Uh, we really would like to see it as as an it, we tend to see it as an edge device in the same way that that a lot of complex systems are edge devices. Uh, they do a certain amount of compute on prem on, on prem in a car essentially on the premises of a car and uh, have a, a strong connection to the outside world up to a cloud system perhaps um, and then we also talked about uh, creating a centos variant uh, we do want this variant to be based on centos stream we're very uh, keyed into the stream process uh, the the variant will have a regular release schedule uh, that will be determined by the participants as we move forward. And uh, of course, it'll have a manifest also determined by the SIG participants. So the people who come to the SIG meetings are the ones who will decide what kind of content goes into, into this, uh, this, uh, this variant. I'm just about to turn my camera off again accidentally. So um, I think that this slide has been presented once or twice during this during the dojo. Uh, this just goes over the RHEL development process through CentOS Stream and uh, where RHEL fits into this and how um, how the uh, how the upstreams flow. I guess is a good way to put it. And what we are doing is kind of injecting automotive into this. So right down here is the uh, the automotive SIG and um, the output of which will be the automotive variant. And uh, the results of this will also simply be upstream to RHEL and then thus upstream to the Red Hat in-vehicle operating system as that continues to be developed. Um, I think I can make these slides available in public. They're actually a variant of them uh, that we've already presented within the SIG. So I'll make these available after the, after the talk. Uh, we talked about the general goals. Uh, one thing we didn't develop is that we that we covered very uh, extensively in meetings is the need for stickers, and we want to thank Rich for his uh, dedication to uh, to stickers in the process. Specifically for the rest of 2021, which is rapidly getting toward the holiday season, um, our goal is mainly to build a, a foundational community from the ground up. We want to establish good working relationships among all of the participants. We're very glad to see the number of participants who have shown up so far. Uh, we intend to, uh, to do outreach and encourage others to join and to make this a, a true open source project. We do not want this to be a, a closed system or an open source in name only kind of a thing. This, one's, this is to a, a real open source process with real outputs. Uh, we intend to create robust community guidelines. Uh, we're in the process right now of developing a contribution guideline. Um, we've discussed at the last two meetings whether or not we should have any changes to the, uh, the, the uh, code of conduct. Um, of course, as a SIG, we are subject to the CentOS code of conduct. We're very happy for that. Rich, is, Rich and, and Bex and everybody have already gone through the process of developing that code of conduct. Um, and we want to see if there's anything else that we need to add to it. Um, but this will all be done uh, within the group. This is not ever going to be a, a star chamber situation. Uh, we will have administrative roles. Right now, I'm in the role of acting chair, which means that I'm the one who gets to put slides together and uh, handle the meeting schedule and do quarterly updates to the CentOS board as required. Very happy to do that. and. Uh, I can totally see that being a role that is shared and rotated among all of the participants, all the participating organizations, and, and uh, really whoever is uh, is interested in doing that kind of thing. We plan to document all of the plans that we're doing for the CentOS automotive variant. We'd like to get a manifest together as we go forward. Um, Rachel will go over the current state of, of the build system and the infrastructure and the test infrastructure. And a number of people involved with this have submitted presentations to the Automotive Linux Summit. So hopefully we'll be able to have a presence there and, uh, and uh, talk to the rest of the general public. For the decision-making process, the really the main goal is to decide on things together. Um, CentOS is a shining example of a, an open source project that actually works 
in open in the open in a transparent way and we really want to maintain that because we totally see the the value of using the open source process in development and uh, and applying that to the automotive world uh, we do want to find a real chair in early 2022 after we've gotten a few months of of effort underneath and maybe uh, of getting some builds running, getting the infrastructure going and getting some documentation up. And once we do that, we can really focus on governance and uh, moving forward. Um, we would do, obviously do the contribution guidelines. They require a contribution process uh, and uh, we really wanna make sure that all hands are on deck for it. So as far as community standards that we've been doing, developing so far, uh, communications are obviously one of the main things that we're doing within this SIG. Uh, asynchronous communications, we've got the automotive SIG mailing list and also the CentOS develop mailing list. Uh, we encourage people to use both of those. Uh, and in fact, we'd like to push as much to the CentOS develop mailing list as possible. The automotive SIG mailing list will be specifically for SIG business. But if there's anything that applies to the to CentOS in general, it, that it belongs on CentOS Devel. We have synchronous communications over on Liberia chat. Uh, we've got an IRC channel all to ourselves. It hasn't been really active, but I would love to see that change. Uh, there's a number of us who simply stay logged in all day. So pop in and say hi. Uh, there's a link here in these um, in these uh, these slides, but it's very easy to go to. You just go to Liberia.chat and log in and once you're there you can go to the centos dash automotive i think it's slash hash mark centos dash automotive right here channel uh, we do have periodic in-person meetings there's a monthly formal meeting um, you can contact me if you'd like to be uh, on the invitation for it but it is an open meeting and we uh, publish it about a week ahead of time uh, it's on the um the wiki is where we publish the shared notes for that and uh, we publish those about a week ahead of time so people have a link we um we also have uh that happens once every, about every four weeks and about every two weeks we have a month a monthly office hours or on the alternate two weeks uh which is a much more informal meeting it's there's no agenda uh, we've only had one of these so far but it was very successful i think we had about 32 people there and um we just get together to talk about automotive things and the, the things that are going to be happening in the SIG and uh, and general news. And uh, we expect to continue that. Um, it's in addition to the IRC channel and the mailing list. Uh, we talked already about the code of conduct. Um, and again, I wanna to continue to hammer this home. All policies within this SIG will be determined by the community, will not be driven by any one particular company. So um, technical status, uh, Red Hat is currently setting up at the initial infrastructure. Uh, we're contributing that to the SIG. Uh, it's going to be under GitLab. We had some discussion about that and settled on GitLab. Be it the initial CI CD system. Uh, the initial code contribution drop will be uh, essentially the, the build artifacts from, uh, from Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat will also be contributing QA resources, which uh, Rachel can talk about in just a few minutes. And then, um, actually, pretty. I think in the next slide. And then uh, Al will be uh, covering hardware support. Uh, we've got uh, a number of ideas about which hardware to support. Uh, we are aiming towards an ARM64 platform. Um, there's been a number of contenders for that, uh, and uh, a lot of discussion about which kind, what hardware we should support, and and what features within that hardware. So Al can cover that a little bit. And uh, I don't know if I'm talking really fast or if I'm uh, doing that, but um, if Rachel, if you are around, I think we can get you hooked up to take over for me. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rachel Sibley, I'm the QE lead for uh, the automotive program. Um, so we're basically for the test coverage, um, we're having discussions that are re related to both the certification process and some engagements with uh, a few proof of concept customers. 
Uh, it's helped us better understand where our gaps are related to both our processes and test coverage in terms of safety. Um, we are actively reviewing existing tests and making improvements to better address the use cases and potential hazards that could happen in a car. So for some time now, we've been engaged in the public facing GitLab CI by contributing changes related to build system improvements in order to make it more scalable um, in addition to new test coverage that would run on top of the build, um, the build images. So we're evaluating different failure scenarios using containers for isolation. Uh, the test coverage is meant to verify if containers are sufficient for isolating misbehaving applications, which could potentially interfere with a, a critical safety application. In addition, we are in the process of automating new test coverage related to measuring uh, boot time performance. Um, so we're going to be pushing this to a visual aid where we can gauge performance over time. Um, to start, we're testing in VMs, but eventually we'll tie this into real hardware, which would closely resemble what we would see in a car. Um, right now it's triggering off of CentOS stream builds using a manifest based on RHEL for Edge to build a sample image, but there are plans to extend this to the SIG. Uh, so we're still very early on in the process and continuing to review and make improvements for test coverage. So more of this to come. And it's CentOS Stream 8, yes. <laughs> Daniel's question. But yes, we want to move to CentOS Stream 9. That's in our plans. OK. That's great. I didn't see the question. Excellent. Uh, there's a Q&A box I hadn't even noticed about that. <laughs> so before we get totally into Q&A, that'd be great. Let's, um, uh, let's jump over to Al. Al, are you around? There is a blue button, I believe, that you would need to click in order to share audio and video. And while Al is getting set up, uh, we can say, where are the hobbyists and mall? Oh, there's Al for now. All right, we'll go through Q&A in just a few minutes. In the meantime, I will give Al the platform and even your own blank slide. Yeah, this the the blank side is kind of representative of a lot of my thinking about this, um, unfortunately. So as it turns out, um, you know, uh, as Jeffrey said, we're we're really kind of focusing on ARM sixty four <clears throat> because that seems to be where a lot of the demand is, and um, uh, it, it is in the industry at large. But there are so many choices there. Um, one of the issues that we're running into is just chip availability in, in the industry at large. So, for example, one of um, one of the devices that we can find very, very, very easily is a Raspberry Pi 4. So we're probably going to be doing a lot of work there. Um, but that's really just primarily because it's cheap and it's available. On the other hand, there are boards such, excuse me, such as the uh, NVIDIA Jetson family. Um, and we're looking at uh, NX and AGX versions of those. Those are actually much better boards in the sense that they are much more powerful processors. Um, they actually have some GPUs on them for uh, AI and ML type type activities um, that, that we know are going to be happening ultimately. So, you know, they're much better candidates. They're extremely difficult to find. Um, as it turns out this morning, I, I did find nine of them in China. Um, and <laughs> the, they, are, they are listed at three times their normal asking price. So uh, this is kind of the thing we're, we're seeing with a lot, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the suppliers these days. So Raspberry Pi 4 is, is probably going to be a, a primary driver for a lot of this. Um, We'd also like to look at some of the, the Renesas boards, um, you know, things based on IMX8 um, in particular. You know, Snapdragon we know is is being used quite a bit as, as a Qualcomm processor. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll be taking a look at many of them and we'd like to support many of them. And, um, you know, I, ideally enable them with a single kernel. That's, that's kind of a goal in the background as well. Um, 
so that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, we, you know, we're open to recommendations, obviously, um, but, but you know, please let us know if you've got something specific that you would you think would be a better uh, solution. Um, we 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 know there's everything from the solid run macchiato bins to things from all winter to things you know just all over the, the spectrum. Uh, 96 boards, for example. Um, but yes, we, what we want to do is we want to make sure that whatever we end up using, and, and hence the discussion about the, the Raspberry Pi, um, is, is readily available so that anybody that wants to can replicate the work that's being done in, in, a, in the most straightforward fashion possible. Um, yeah, uh, other things to consider is uh, we will be looking at um, what, one of the things that's interesting in this field is there's not nearly as much standardization as uh, one would like. Uh, something that, that uh, distributions rely on very heavily, such as UEFI or Device Tree or ACPI. Um, so we may maybe we may end up being involved in some of those efforts as well, just to make sure that we can make sure that CentOS and the hardware all fit together properly. And, and, and work smoothly. Um, to, to borrow a phrase from a, a friend of mine, it should just be boring um, to get this all to work. But that said, I'd be more than glad to answer questions. If it were boring, they wouldn't need us, right? Correct. Something about job security, but yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, um, we have uh, the only thing left on my list here is an open discussion, and I, we do have a number of questions here, which I'm really glad to see. Um, I'm going to just dive right in. And the first one I'd like to grab is the second question. How do you plan to collaborate with Fedora on a lot of this stuff? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that this work is being done solely in CentOS, because if we go back to the, uh, the magical diagram, you can see that the Fedora is actually directly upstream of CentOS stream. And I think that a lot of the hardware support that we are using will end up being pushed through Fedora and then into CentOS from there. Al, is, is, that, is that a reasonable expectation, or am I totally off base with that? No, no. I, I believe there's a great deal of overlap between the two. Um, okay. You know, CentOS can learn from Fedora and, and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, uh, I hate to mention it again, but um, one of the things that Fedora does is it has a way of handling some of the weirdness with device tree on ARM devices, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it works a lot better than some of the other ways. Um, you know, CentOS could, could use some of that kind of knowledge, for example. Um, will we use it? to be determined but um, that's that's the kind of thing where I, I see there being a lot of overlap between the two and a lot of, of interaction between the two i agree with that rachel rachel i noticed you, uh, you unmuted oh i just no i didn't mean to unmute sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay just, just ignore me oh yeah feel free to feel free to dive in um one thing i would say is that the reason that we chose CentOS rather than Fedora for this is simply because uh, the stream process seemed to be more appropriate to what we were doing. Um, I would love to see some more automotive work being done upstream in Fedora as well, and totally open to that. Um, the first question here on the list was, uh, what, what, what cars are planned to have CentOS? Are we looking at Teslas, Volvos, Volkswagens, or something else? Um, we have not. As a CentOS SIG, we have not actually gone out and talked to any automotive manufacturers directly. That being said, there are some OEMs and tier one suppliers who have been attending the meetings. And so the goal, I think, is for us really to use CentOS as a test bed for others to develop products, including Red Hat. And then um, the problem with putting these things into cars is that in order to be in a car, the operation, particularly at any level above, uh, above uh, a very base level of, of operation. It has to be functionally certified, functionally safe certified through ISO 26262. And uh, that is really difficult to do in general, but it's, it's particularly difficult to do for uh, an open source project. So um, we obviously are working very hard on that and we wanna do as much of that open source work in public as well. Uh, 
And uh, to that end, um, Red Hat is a board member of ELISA, the, which is Enabling Linux and Safety Applications. It is a project underneath the Linux Foundation. Uh, we're doing, we will be doing the work that we do uh, in large part within the context of ELISA. And I would encourage anybody who's interested to attend the ELISA workshop coming up in November. We will yeah, definitely to, have some presentations there. To, to add to that, um, mm -hmm. most of those folks that, that are mentioned in that list are also part and parcel of uh, a lot of the Lonaro work that's going on in, mm -hmm. in automotive, as well as uh, ARM has recently started an organization called SOFI, mm -hmm. um, S-O-A-F-E-E, -E, um, that is, is open membership for anybody interested. And service-oriented architecture for edge environments. Ooh, yes. First try, awesome. Um, sure. <laughs> but uh, the, many of these folks are also part of that organization and, and are actively mm -hmm. participating in it as well. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of direct connection between folks working on CentOS, folks working on SOFI, folks working at the, at the various manufacturers. But you know, I, I do want to stress what Jeffrey was saying that um, I think one of the intents is to be neutral in the mm -hmm. whole thing in a way. Um, we don't want to necessarily, you know, become the replacement for the, the Tesla OS. That would be right. fun, but that's, that's you know, we want to have the, I, I think we want to have a target that's broader than that and, and provide basic infrastructure for any auto manufacturer. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to put it. So, um, so moving on, what kind of hardware? We did talk about hardware pretty extensively. Uh, we'd be very welcome if you want to mention in the chat. I can only keep an eye on the chat or the QA window, but uh, I would um, I would love to hear some more ideas about hardware. Uh, one thing that was mentioned in one of the other questions is Risk Five, and uh, and uh, MIPS sixty four. It's interesting that MIPS as an organization has actually. Uh, they're migrating wholesale over to the Risk Five architecture. Um, I, uh, I've seen from my coffee cup, I have a strong interest in Risk Five. I actually helped, uh, I worked on Risk Five International for two years. I was at the Linux Foundation, and I see a great amount of uh, of uh, potential in with Risk Five in automotive. And uh, to that end, I would like to start an automotive discussion group over in Risk Five before the end of the year. And that's um, that's in the works. Um, right now, I don't know that there's any hardware that is specifically applicable within the RISC-V world to automotive in the same way that we're doing it. Possibly uh, some of the sci five boards and maybe the Polar Fire SOC would be a, an option. Might be something that we could look at. I know that those boards are supported within Fedora. At least there is, a, I know that the Polar Fire is. So, um, so yeah, there's definitely some options there. Um, yeah, just to add another little bit to that. Um, mm -hmm. A few days ago, Mobileye announced some some very significant interest in Risk Five. Mm. Um, they're they're a key player in the automotive marketplace. I don't know how that's going to play out with with um, the various OSs because it's a very specialized processor. But but there will be a connection at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one interesting thing about this world is that um, automotive has a lot of a, a very strong incumbent players, and so um, new hardware like Risk Five is uh, is uh, it's sort of groundbreaking, and it takes a while for groundbreaking systems to break into uh, existing um, very mature ecosystems like automotive. So, uh, what kind of hardware would need to be just meaningful you know, need to participate in a meaningful way in the SIG. If you can get your hands on a Raspberry Pi 4, I have a feeling that's probably where we're going to end up first. Um, I I have ideas about hardware. Al and I have talked about this many times over many virtual times. beer. And I think that uh, I, I think that there's going to be a lot more going on hardware wise probably toward the beginning of, of the year. Right now the goal with the SIG is to get the SIG up and running to get the infrastructure in place and to get the governance in place and to uh, to really just kind of get people involved and companies, get companies involved too. How much overlap is there going to be with IoT in general as it seems to be a tremendous amount of lead over? This is from Jack. Um, 
That is certainly true. And uh, for that reason, I think we'll be very conversant with the Fedora IoT uh, working group. I don't know, it's a working group. Yeah, Fedora IoT working group. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of use case similarities between IoT and Edge in, this, in, a, in a context like a car. Um, you know, Edge right now is being used to refer to so many different things that it's kind of hard to, to narrow it down. What we mean by Edge is a using the car, seeing the car as a, a complex compute entity in itself that is part of a larger system. Uh, that um, that is a, that is different from an embedded device, which is really a discrete device that has a, most of its compute power on its own. It might reach out in the same way that uh, that uh, uh, a car like right now would reach out for for navigation data. Um, an edge device would probably still reach out for navigation data, but it might be able to make some decisions about that data on its own. Um, Right now, I mean, that, that this is what the experiment part that's down here in this in this tan box is really all about. The idea is that we will be experimenting and figuring out where the boundaries are between automotive and IoT and edge and uh, and going forward from there. And in, in addition, with the test coverage, we we set up the namespace in something called Edge because we wanted to be applicable to. IoT and Rail for Edge, because I know a lot of the test coverage will be applicable there as well. So we would we didn't want to have forks of tests that um, would diverge. We wanted to have everything in the same place that could be useful in all of these different scenarios. Yeah, and and, and again, I think one of the places where it gets where it's going to blur a great deal is uh, in the automotive space. They are using some very beefy processors, um, you know, eight, 16, 32 core machines um, that you would just never have thought of putting in an embedded device. So, right. um, yeah, it, it's it's kind of a slightly different world, but um, but yeah, the overlap is 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 big. So, you know, in, embedded, I may may just get away with one small Cortex M processor, but in, in automotive, we're seeing things like well, like on the NVIDIA board where there's an eight core uh, ARM64 unit plus the GPU for AI plus, you know, um, image processing. And, and you know, it's, it's all that big. Right. And uses remarkably little power. Oh my gosh, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing that is actually very different now from automotive even five or 10 years ago. And of course the development cycle within automotive takes, you know, five years. Through, through the functional security and everything else, supply chain issues. Um, one of the big differences is a consolidation of devices from discrete MCUs of, or ECUs within the within the car into uh, into doing these workloads from a single point and uh, and doing them sometimes in containers. Uh, I know that there's a lot. There are a number of automotive solutions now that use uh, containerized solutions. Um, this is all brand new. I mean, this is all literally within the last five to eight years in automotive. And uh, and it's exciting to be part of that. And that's one of the reasons why Red Hat, at least, has made a choice to move towards automotive, because we see the benefit in that. And we certainly see a crossover within you know, Red Hat's product line and within just the, the way that we think. I and mean, there's certainly, I think, a big opportunity for open source, because there's been so much development in open source over the last 10 years. On, or 15 years on this, you know, 15 years ago, uh, Kubernetes didn't exist and Android was brand new to put things into context. And that's only been two and a half development cycles for a car. So uh, so that part is really exciting. Um, Neil asks, where are the hobbyist and model cars? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I can bring this one up. This is, this is my uh, one that my son created, the, uh, an old, uh, it works in that. Uh, there we go. There we go. So we got some. Um, neither of these, I think, probably has a whole lot of compute on board, and certainly don't need navigation. <laughs> um, yeah. The, so, so very, a couple of very interesting sites to go go check. Deal. Um, our uh, waveshare.com, mm -hmm. and uh, waveshare does both a, an NVIDIA and a Raspberry Pi supported version. 
Um, and, and both of those are, are that's, a, that's meant for autonomous driving. Um, now, it, it may not go very fast, but, but it is supposed to be autonomous. Uh, the other place to look at is um, uh, a place called f one tenth dot mm -hmm. org. So f the number one t n t h dot org. Um, that's that's kind of like a semi professional racing league uh, of of custom modders for RC cars. That um, man, some some of them have some pretty 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 nice uh, processors on top of them, things that I wouldn't mind putting in my own desktop or server. Um, and then the uh, other one that's that's pretty funky and, and kind of my my personal favorite is uh, one called donkeycar.org. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically a, a grounds up, a grassroots type organization out of Oakland, California that um, does some pretty amazing things on a shoestring. And um, so, so you can actually order pre-printed parts <laughs> um, that you just attach to a vehicle and um, you know, plug your Raspberry Pi on there. And again, all open source software. So you know, have fun, right? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's a long way from uh, seeing some of the uh, early robotics. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Maker Fair about probably must have been 12 years ago. And there were, uh, you know, self-driving cars that were driving around on our ankles, and uh, they were simply programmed to use their sensors to avoid running into people. That was their only goal, and they did mm -hmm. an extremely marvelous job. And that was that was a while back. Right. And then, uh, Neil also asks, does this mean CentOS Stream and Rail will finally get support for the Raspberry Pi four? <laughs> I I'm not going to answer Neil. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, can you define support? Um, yeah, I, um, I, I, I would, I would go, I will venture out and say I would expect it to, to a certain degree. I would expect that the the output of the automotive SIG will probably run on a on a Raspberry Pi four if that ends up being the the hardware of choice and that if you want to ensure that that happens please come to the sig meetings and help us work on it yeah that, that's that's a really good way to put it um and, and because this is community work it's really kind of what the community decides to do right um mm -hmm. the, the, which is very different than the commercial rail product mm -hmm. exactly exactly so uh, Jack asks, can anyone speak a little bit about the rationale of having the SIG be automotive focused and not just a general IoT SIG? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I have been at Red Hat for just over six months, and uh, my focus when I came here was automotive and, and still is automotive. And, uh, and so that's really the lens that I've been looking at these things through. Um, and to be completely transparent, Automotive is a product line that Red Hat is pursuing. And IoT currently isn't in terms of specific IoT products. So that's really the rationale for Red Hat to be involved with this automotive SIG. Personally speaking, as a longtime embedded and IoT developer, technical writer, and community manager, I would absolutely love to see a CentOS IoT spin. Uh, just in the same way that there's a Fedora IoT spin. And I would love to see work going on in both projects that eventually migrates into products for Red Hat and any other companies that decide to use it. So, um, and I certainly don't see there's any that there's any um, uh, uh, problem with that. I think that, that it's, uh, that's a nice thing about an open source project is that it is wide open. And if you have an interest in it, you can come and bring that interest in and get people working on it. So yeah, let's do it. I'm down. <laughs> let's talk about starting an IoT SIG if you want to. Give me a yeah, send me an email. I'm Jeffro at redhat.com, by the way. J-E-F-R-O at redhat.com if anybody wants to chat about any of this stuff. Uh, we have an anonymous question. Uh, RHEL has historically shied away from supporting device tree-based ARM hardware in favor of UEFI, which has very little adoption in the ARM space. Is this changing now? I'm going to leave that one to Al. Yeah, I figured you would. I, I was really actually just kind of waiting for when this would show up. Um, so, so let's distinguish uh, UEFI versus um, mm -hmm. 
uh, U-boot and and then uh, ACPI versus DT. So U-boot and UEFI. Um, one of the things that we see happening, even in the IoT world and, and the edge world, is um, the ARM system ready program is moving things in, in a way that is very similar to what happened with ARM server. Mm -hmm. So with ARM server, we insisted on standardization because, again, we wanted to make things just absolutely dead boring. And, uh, you know, I, I will will not lie, I, I did a very happy dance when the first ARM server installed RHEL out of the box, completely untouched, right? Standard bits. So that, that was what we were aiming for. UEFI and U-Boot through the system ready program are being forced into, not being forced into, I shouldn't say that, that's not correct. Um, the certification under system ready allows for a UEFI interface to the firmware. So whether it's U-Boot or UEFI, nobody really cares, right? It, it, you could write something in Rust if you wanted, you know, go nuts, have fun, as long as it presents a UEFI interface. Mm -hmm. um, and ARM system ready is, is actively pushing that. Interestingly enough, the, the RISC-V folks are, are copying a lot of that that sort of standardization as they move along. So so for that part of the firmware, you know, yes, UEFI is, is probably going to be there and it's probably going to become more ubiquitous than it already is. Um, for DT versus ACPI, it's a different thing. And, and we need to be very clear about what, what OS or what distribution we're talking about. Will RHEL ever go to DT? Um, I seriously doubt it. Uh, RHEL is a commercial enterprise level OS, and until Red Hat decides that they want to actually push that into the edge or into IoT, it will be UEFI and it will be ACPI. Those are the standards. Those are what makes makes life good for everybody. That's what we will do. Um, now, in the CentOS SIG, in the CentOS distribution or Fedora distribution or you know, open embedded or anything else, mm -hmm. um, DT could be a player. And one of the interesting things is it, it is, there is much more works in going on standardizing DT than there has been in the past for precisely the same sort of reasons that we standardized on, on ACPI in the server space. Um, it just makes it easier for vendors to know what to do and how to do it. So could DT at some point um, become a standard part of all of these distros? Sure. Um, is that something that, that RHEL is going to commit to? No, not anytime soon. So hopefully that answers the, the question. I hope so too. I thought that was very complete. So the final question on our Q&A block is, will you be working with other transport devices like large trucks and buses? Um, I would I would like to hope so. I would love to see some sort of fleet type vehicles have some representation within the CentOS SIG. Uh, I think that they bring a very interesting and unique use case to the automotive world because when we think of automotive, particularly from the point of view of a, of a base operating system that workloads in, run on top of, we, um, we have some pretty specific guidelines that, that we're going for and specific uh, ISO standards and such that we're aiming at. But um, certainly the truck networks and the bus networks, they have a, they have a, a much more, um, let's say robust, but probably I would actually really the word I'm looking for, I think is standardized way of doing things. You know, a bus takes the same route every time. A, a, a truck has, even a long haul truck has a specific workload that it's, that it's operating on. And um, while it might encounter a lot of, uh, of variations along the way, it really does have a very single-minded thing. I know a lot of the early automated driving stuff was done uh, using big trucks as the use case model. So um, I would even include things beyond wheeled vehicles in that. I mean, we could certainly talk about ships. You know, uh, I think just uh, over the last couple of months, I think they've they've announced that there are a couple of auto self-driving container ships that are currently making their way across the oceans of the world. Um, and that's a really interesting use case. And it's not 
significantly different from what we're addressing here in automotive. So, um, so from that perspective, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. I'd love to talk. I'd love to. I personally would love to talk about aviation as well, but uh, that's you know certainly from a regulatory standpoint, that's a completely different discussion. <laughs> well, and not only that, it's things like uh, warehouse robots, right? And yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Robots and yeah. I mean, there's a whole raft of things that would be, you know, I'd love lawnmowers. <laughs> lawnmowers, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> I totally want to groom the lawnmower. Right, right. And let my son keeps threatening to build one. I'm holding to it. So, um, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just peeking into the chat and, and, and scrolling back. So um, I know we're tor sort of reaching toward the end of our, our time here. Rich will Something keep to rake up. leaves. Oh, my God. Oh, raking leaves would be nice. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky enough to have just evergreens in my particular yard. Um, you know, automated gutter cleaning. That's what I would really like. That's a good one too. Nice messy job that seems seems like it could be automated. So um, just uh, scrolling back a little bit. So we probably have time for one more question if there if there are any. Al, I have a question. You mentioned um, donkeycar.org. Mm -hmm. uh, that appears to not be the right website. Oh, um, really? Maybe I'm spelling it wrong. I don't know how else you would spell donkey car, but you know. Yeah, I don't. Uh, it's very possible I got it wrong too. I've got donkey donkeycar.com. Yeah, donkeycar.com. Oh, all right, there we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. My apologies. Yes. Yep. All right, last call for questions. Thanks, Rich. I'd, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> so as there appear to be no more questions, uh, thank you so much, all three of you, for this great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for all of your amazing questions. And yeah, thanks a lot. And please definitely come to the SIG meetings. And uh, and join the mailing list uh, if you have any if it, have an interest in this at all. You know we're really happy for all participation. We would like to have as many people on board and as many voices in the mix as possible because that's the way the open source world works. <laughs>